live stream has started. I'll be making the webinar live in the next minute. Just a heads up. Okay, I'm starting the webinar and then I'll start with the introduction when, once we have a few people. Okay, so we have a good base of participants. I'll just start with the, with the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's uh, session on fleet management, a session which is aptly titled The Future of Fleet Management, Top Tech Trends in 2022. Uh, this session is brought to you by the team at Commercial Vehicle Forum, or as we are more popularly known as uh, CVF. Uh, this is in partnership with Shell Fleet Solutions, and my name is Ruvid Devan, and I'm the event director at CVF. While most of you are already aware, uh, for some of the people who are joining in who, who are new to us, just to give you a very quick introduction, Commercial Vehicle Forum is India's premium sea-level uh, commercial vehicle and road transport event. And uh, before we start today's session, I am also really pleased to share that you know uh, we are also we also do this event on the two wheeler, three wheeler, and EV sector called TWF Two Wheeler Forum, three -wheel, two wheeler, three wheeler, and EV Forum, which is back on twenty second uh, September at the Eros Hotel in New Delhi. Uh, this is the fourth edition, and we are back to our pre pandemic glory for this one. So if you're interested, uh, head on over to our website on twforum.in and register yourself, and uh, you know feel free to reach out to us. Now, moving on to the agenda for today's uh, session. Yeah, so now moving on to the agenda for today's session, uh, we will first of all, uh, starting with a brief introduction wherein I will introduce the speakers and moderator. Our moderator will then give you a quick overview of the topic and then start the discussion. Uh, we will also devote a minute or two uh, to run few polls during the session, and we will also have an audience Q&A. Other than that, uh, we will uh, post the panel discussion. There'll be a brief presentation by uh, Tin Z, uh, who's the telematics business development lead at Shell on some of the aspects that we'll be discussing during today's session. Your active participation is essential to make the session a success. Right now we have you all in listen only mode, but this is how you can communicate with us. You can ask us questions. Uh, there is a Q&A box in the control panel at the bottom of your screen. You can put in your questions in that Q&A box, uh, asking you to do that as it helps us refer to your questions in a focused manner. You can also choose to upvote these questions so that it helps us in addressing the most burning topics. We also invite you to share your insights in the polls that we'll be running, you know, flashing across your screen at regular intervals. At regular intervals. Do note that we also have this session streaming live on YouTube and you will also receive a recording of this session post the completion of the session. Apart from that, I request you to share your insights in the feedback form that will open as soon as you exit the session. If there's something else you're interested in learning more about, do definitely reach out to us. So before we begin today's session, I wanted to now take this time to especially thank our partner, Shell Fleet Solutions, for supporting this session. Uh, while most of you are already aware, Shell is an integrated energy company that aims to meet the world's energy demand for energy in economically, environmentally, and socially responsible ways. They use advanced technologies and take an innovative approach to help build a sustainable energy future. With a retail presence across six states that include Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Telangana, Maharashtra, Gujarat, and Assam, Shell is expanding its network of fuel stations across the country. Shell Fleet Solutions, the B2B arm of Shell Retail, caters to the mobility needs of fleet owners with an integrated offering across differentiated fuels, 
telematics and nature based solutions shelf free solutions has been present in more than 30 countries across the globe for 60 years making them the biggest b2b fuel cart company with over 1.65 million customers transacting with them every day their mission is to become the customer's first choice for sustainable mo mobility solutions through trust transparency and value so now moving on to the panel discussion i would like to briefly introduce our expert speaker group firstly i would like to welcome mr vivek juneja a first generation entrepreneur a man with a vision he along with his brother started their business with merely two trucks in 1996 vivek juneja is the founder and managing director of varuna group and has grown it into one of india's leading home grown logistics warehousing and integrated services company he has built this 26 year legacy from scratch and is nurturing his dream into high growth high value logistics empire a visionary veteran he focuses on formulating st strategies for the organization to ensure its long term success some of the things that he handles at work include human resources information technology accounts customer relation and infra development these are some of the critical business areas that he closely monitors and guides next we have berry who is a strong business focused sales and marketing leader with over 20 years of experience in pnl management operations and network strategy development she has experience and proven capability to manage and coach cross cultural teams and provide consultative solutions to external stakeholders at local cluster and global levels in top tier multinational oil and gas company she has been associated with shell for almost two decades now and is currently gm fleet solutions asia at shell in terms of her education she graduated from the Hong university of hong kong and is an mba from hk ust business school our third speaker for the session is mr abhilek kumar who is director and head of business development india and south asia at uber abhilek has over 15 years of professional experience across management consulting and a diverse set of functional roles across multiple tech companies in fact he has previously worked with the likes of flipkart cars24 reliance entertainment yatra mckinsey and infosys in terms of his education he is an mba from darden school of business and a btech plus mtech from iit kharagpur next we have reema jogani who is director at reema transport private limited or rtpl for short she is part of the second generation entrepreneurship team of rtpl after her post graduation diploma in business administration wherein she majored in marketing she worked with companies such as kpmg ey large media houses like star movies national geographic and bloomberg utv while she felt that it was always fun working with large professional companies she was excited to join the family business as she believed the entrepreneurial genes in her made her want to make a mark of her own she joined rtpl 10 years ago and this is a company which was founded by her father mr ashok kothari who is a self made entrepreneur and someone who started the transport business with a three wheeler vehicle in 1983 rtpl today is a full blown transport organization with a fleet of well over 100 trucks RTPL is into cold chain transportation and ambient transportation servicing the west south and central india reema is a much sought after speaker and was most recently awarded woman entrepreneur of the year by news channel tv9 in the recently concluded road transport awards our final speaker for the session is chandresh natu who is practice head at wipro chandresh has over 24 years of experience in corporate real estate cost optimization project management and process improvement He has worked with industry leaders like Magnum Group of companies, Tata Teleservices, and Nortel. For over last 13 years, he has gone through three major M&As. He joined Hewitt Associates, Aon, Allied Solutions, and now Wipro. In terms of his education, he is a civil engineer with a postgraduate in construction management and an MBA from Indian School of Business, Hyderabad. And he is also a certified Lean Six Sigma practitioner. Our moderator for the session is Kaushik Madhavan, who is part of the Mobility Business Unit at Frost and Sullivan India. He has almost two decades of experience in the automotive and logistics industry, especially when it comes to strategic consulting and market research. His experience base covers a wide range of sectors, leveraging long-standing working relationships with senior management executives. Kaushik, with his deep expertise in the auto and logistics sector, 
is a much sought after consultant and speaker. And we are incredibly honored to have him on board today as a moderator for the session. Over to you, Kaushik, to take it forward. Thank you very much, uh, Rohit, for the wonderful introduction. Um, you were very generous with, uh, with, the, with the introduction. Thank you very much for that. Uh, a warm welcome once again to every, uh, every panelist here today. Um, it's always good to talk about big management solutions because it is one of, the, one of those topics in the mobility industry today that, uh, that is seeing a lot of activities you know, from multiple angles, right? Today, that is going to be uh, the, the, the topics of discussion, right? Uh, even in India, we have seen a lot of investments, a lot of new players coming up with new business models, specifically looking at fleet management solutions. So clearly, you know, some of the most important trends that we can expect to see in the next, let's say, one or two years, you know, is not only on the one hand, electrification, right? So we are seeing a lot of the small, medium, and large fleet operators investing in electrified fleet management solutions, right? Um, with electric LCVs coming in, we already have quite a few um, electric last mile delivery vehicles, you know, electric three wheelers, two wheelers, and so on. And we are also seeing a lot of convergence in the space. Today, we are see seeing cross selling, you know, um, through, through uh, partner platforms where third party solution providers can come on board and start offering their solutions. And we are also seeing artificial intelligence, you know, uh, making a big impact, taking a big mark in fleet management solutions. So when we talk about artificial intelligence, not only are we looking at driver behavior management, vehicle performance management, and your typical, um, you know, um, uh, solutions like, you know, geofencing, tracking and tracing, uh, fuel theft monitoring, and a lot of these things are becoming more and more important. Now, as we go forward, specifically in the um, fleet management uh, space, we will see what we call as a video safety boom. That means a lot of the fleet management solutions are going to be incorporating video technology, could be within the vehicle, could be around the vehicle and so on to increase safety and security, not only for the drivers and fleet operators, but essentially for the customers who are transporting their, their wares through your fleet management solutions. Now, if you look at growth opportunities, one of the most important ones that we have seen is the emergence of health, wellness, and well-being, right? So when we talk about health, wellness, and well-being, typically we are talking about driver-centric solutions, right? Could be a, a, a weekly or a monthly uh, driver health dashboard. I'm sure some of you who are managing fleets today are already investing in this. And that's going to be one of the most important differentiators as we go forward. How some of the fleets are going to increase their emphasis on driver management, right? Could be health, could be wellness and well-being as well. Now, uh, <clears throat> some of the areas of differentiation that we have seen uh, when it comes to uh, connectivity or connected vehicles or fleet management solutions is, you know, we are increasingly looking at brand agnostic telematic solutions, right? We've got on the one hand, obviously some of the OEM service providers uh, who are in the market, who equip their vehicles, you know, at the sale uh, uh, itself with telematic solutions. But on the other hand, we're also seeing a lot of third party fleet management solution companies. And that is where the value addition and differentiation is happening. How these brand agnostic telematics IoT platforms are bringing in value, bringing in external players, third party service providers in order to add more and more value to the fleet operator, whether it is a large, medium or a small fleet operator. And of course, um, uh, not, to, not to forget, uh, the integration of, you know, a smart connectivity, right? Today with smart cards available, um, you know, especially in, in a country like India, uh, digital wallets, right, or smart cards are becoming more and more important in the FMS space or the fleet management solution space. So clearly when we talk about the future of, uh, of fleet management solutions in India, um, it's, it's very bright as we see more and more, like I said before, new business models and non-traditional automotive players today, the likes of, you know, finance service 
uh, companies, insurance companies, uh, intellectual property companies. I mean, who would have thought a few years ago, IP companies would be interested in mobility, right? Today, they are very, very interested. So I think the future is very, very bright for a fleet management solutions in India. And I'm very, very excited to be here with you to discuss some of the trends that we see could be opening up new doors, new avenues to the Indian customer and obviously the fleet management company as well. So let me start uh, with, with Berry. Uh, Berry, you know, um, in a highly competitive market, operational cost reduction becomes a key differentiator for companies, right? Um, now with an increased emphasis on TCO or total cost of ownership, many fleet operators are moving towards what we call as a GCC solution, right? A gross cost contract solution, right? Essentially where large fleets involved, uh, uh, for them the metric of performance will become dollar per mile or rupees per kilometer, right? Um, now, additionally, with the incorporation of IoT or telematics and even customized fleet management solutions, there is an increased visibility on performance and productivity. So performance and productivity are going to become two very, very important parameters going forward. So how important, you know, I would like to know from you, how important is uh, a fleet management solution or a fleet management technology and software, of course, uh, when it comes to productivity enhancement, how does, let's say, shell fleet solutions help fleet managers to achieve uh, their stringent targets of enhanced productivity and performance improvement. What are your thoughts? Thank you, thank you, Karshik. Um, indeed, uh, for fleet management systems, um, it has become quite advanced in these days, uh, allowing fleet companies to manage the end-to-end -end operations um, centrally. And they can now um, actually have 24 seven access to real-time data, including vehicle location, um, and health, fuel consumptions, driver behaviors, and asset tracking that would help a company to take quick decisions on the fly. And this has led to safer journeys that are more cost efficient and environmental friendly. The availability of data not only ensures smooth operations for the current trips, but also enable better future planning capabilities for fleet managers, so they can now optimize their fleet compositions, delivery routes, driver allocation process, and operating costs. So to be more productive and customer-centric, and also more competitive. Uh, excellent points there, Barry. You know, I... I just noted a couple of points you made. You spoke about asset tracking, right? So when it comes to remote fleet management, right? Uh, when you're talking about a centralized control system, right? You know, you've got your dashboards and your control room uh, remotely located. Asset tracking becomes even more important, right? Uh, you know, especially now in the post pandemic era, it's, it's, it's even more uh, important to ensure uh, for a fleet manager, you know, where your truck is, you know, uh, what is the status of the truck and so on and so forth. So in India, you know, um, it's, it's probably something unique to the Indian market, but uh, more often than not, we have seen, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask Rima about this later as well, is that remote management brings a certain perception of lack of trust among the drivers, right? Um, you know, especially when drivers feel they are being monitored, um, they, they seem to lose some form of a trust with their fleet managers or even their employees. Now, uh, that leads to a lack of transparency between drivers and fleet managers, right? Um, now, how do fleet managers manage a complex task of ensuring on-time delivery, compliance for regulations, driver productivity, even fraud detection, right? Maybe not so relevant in, in, in other uh, um, let's say, um, developed countries, but in emerging developing economies, fraud detection is, is, is a very, very important aspect of fleet management. So how, what are your perspectives there? I mean, do you think shell free solutions could play a role in enhancing trust among the drivers and at the same time, reducing fraud and theft and so on? Well, indeed, um, I would say that uh, for fleet management solutions, especially the one that Shell can provide, actually it can help to enhance the transparency 
um, of the data, which will actually right. help the company to um, have um, some informed decisions. Um, the reason behind is that um, with the data itself, it is not simply just a simple GPS. What we are trying to do now is also to provide opportunities for the company to analyze the data, to integrate with their overall system so that they will be able to understand not just on the safety behavior of the individual drivers, but also more forward looking. Because imagine if you know what is the routing of the drivers is doing, what is the driving behavior, we can actually coach the drivers and provide some feedback to the drivers, which can actually help to reduce and avoid any potential incidents and safety incidents for the company, for the, for the driver itself. And on the other hand, uh, from an operational efficiency perspective, with the fleet management system, they will be able to actually reduce significantly on the cost and fuel economies uh, by advanced telematics. So they can also make more compliance of the tracking of the behavior, as well as make certain interventions so that we can have more visibility on the end-to-end -end operations. Excellent, excellent points there. Um, Barry, you know, uh, uh, you mentioned driver coaching, right? It's, it's a very, very important aspect, you know, for, for a country like India. So I'll probably come back to you later on that. Um, just checking, uh, is, is Vivek online? I, I couldn't see Vivek. Uh, uh... Vivek is uh, running late. He'll join in a bit. I, I sent okay. a direct message so we can go on to somebody else. Understood. Understood. No worries. I'll come back to Vivek later. Uh, Abhilek, I want to come to you. Um, now, first of all, congratulations on bringing move to India. Right. I mean, I think that's definitely a, a, um, a very, very important step. Uh, towards, you know, having a, a stronger presence in an emerging market like India. Now, to help, you know, uh, driver partners buy new vehicles using a percentage of their weekly revenues, you know, uh, one of the challenges in India has been vehicle financing, right? Whenever we talk about onboarding new partners, um, driver partners, financing the vehicle purchase is, is, is an eternal problem, right? Especially in the lower end of the spectrum. Now, MOVE now aims to leverage uh, proprietary performance and revenue analytics to underwrite loans to drivers who have previously, um, let's say, been excluded you know, from the, the financial services. Now, I, I understand, and I read an article as well, where you're talking about an innovative rent-to-own model that provides flexible options for drivers who want to get into the business of ride-hailing without having to borrow from car owners or take expensive bank loans or even take loans from the dealership. So what kind of impact do you see, uh, Abhilek, uh, you know, um, this having on both driver partners and customers looking uh, to use Uber services? So what are your thoughts on that? So for the driver partners, I think the one big thing that this solution does is to bring down the barrier of capital that you just described because right. that's the biggest barrier and there are two reasons because of which it's a barrier one is economic of course which is the more visible one but then there is a social barrier also which many of us don't often think about like they don't want to be tied down to a loan which is six seven years in tenure because once they get uh, into some kind of a trouble, like the recent pandemic uh, made them realize, and a vast majority, in fact, and uh, the financiers call uh, for them to pay, and people turn up at their homes, etc., all of that, it creates a very, very poor social situation for them. And then, like everyone, they are also conscious about their standing within their community and everything. So because of these two reasons, in fact, second one, and we, the panelists and everybody might be surprised, is the big reason why they do not want to take loans. They don't want to be tied for those seven years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there is a capital barrier that exists and we needed to bring it down. And because otherwise the people were not coming in, even though they were okay doing lesser paying jobs for 6,000, 6, 7,000, but they didn't want to come into it. How do you break that? And <clears throat> Uh, the traditional ones were not, they were, they were not willing to lend because A, their down payment had increased. Earlier, they used to uh, like provide loans up to 85% and 95%, 90% funding. That reduced to only about 55 and 60% funding in the post-pandemic market. 
So how we had to solve for it. And that's why this whole rent to own model, wherein from the beginning itself, the driver at a very meager, somewhere around 15 days to one month of their uh, monthly rental, they could just go ahead and take the vehicle and keep operating it. <clears throat> and they can just keep paying off uh, their monthly rental by the money that they earn. In fact, the rental is much lesser than what they earn. And from month one itself, they would be earning into their pockets anywhere up beyond 25 to 30,000 rupees, depending on how well they drive. So it, it, it just not just brings down the capital problem barrier for the drivers. It also provides a vast majority of drivers an opportunity for gainful employment. And that's a big thing that happens if we are able to adopt this model successfully. One country which has this model and has implemented it with great success is Brazil. But they have a structural advantage because the cost of vehicle itself for such rental players in Brazil is about 10 to 15% lower. Hence, they are able to undercut the bank loan EMIs for the drivers. We don't have such an advantage in India, but that's a food for thought for the policymakers. So coming back, once this problem is solved for the drivers, more and more drivers come in, which means for the customers, it's a better service, lesser wait times, more drivers, and the whole marketplace on the demand and supply side is a lot more balanced, which at this point of time, is heavily supply constrained all over again. All the all the my fellow panelists will agree that India is, regardless of the segment that you play play in, supply constrained market. It just took us six months within the pandemic and opening for us to again come back to square one. So for the customers, more supply, more people coming in means a better uh, experience and a lesser wait time and a lot more reliability. And for the drivers, it's a way of getting gainful employment. Excellent points there, Abhilek. You know, I, I like the fact that, you know, you touched upon the social impact, right? Uh, I, I completely agree with you on that. I think India, especially when you talk about the rural upcountry markets, right, tier two, tier three cities, where this stigma is, is still a lot more, uh, has a lot more emotional impact than maybe in tier one or metro city. So clearly, uh, that's a very, very good point you make uh, on gainful employment as well. Uh, uh, another point I, I, I just, just came to my mind as you were saying this, India is, is, is a, uh, a market where the pre-owned vehicles uh, uh, is, is, is much, much bigger than the new vehicle. So do you think, you know, uh, the entire used car market ecosystem um, and, or let's say in combination with your move ecosystem could become a, a lot more attractive for a potential driver partner coming to uh, uh, the Uber, uh, coming onto the Uber platform? I think the used car market on the commercial side is a Shakespearean tragedy, if I may use the word, <laughs> in India. Because we all see that, but the process is so complicated that it is impossible to unlock it. Right, what is the right. used car market? I mean, I have personally worked on it n number of times, tried to crack it, failed it at least five times, and still hope for one day that I'll be able to crack it. The problem is that A the transfer of ownership from one person to another is such a complicated process. I personally tried doing it for one vehicle. It took three months. Imagine trying to do that at a scale. You can't do it. Yeah. If unfortunately it happens to be a private vehicle and then you are trying to convert into commercial one, God help you. That is even more uh, troublesome. So it is next to impossible to crack and unlock the used car market on the commercial side of things. Hence, it is far more easier for anyone to just go buy and start driving. They can just change hands between friends, between family. But uh, I would say proper paperwork transfer of ownership, which is what we require structured companies will for them to be able to drive is something that's not happening anytime soon. Right. So maybe, uh, Rohit, um, next time we could uh, try having some policymakers and uh, representatives from the government who could probably help us address this challenge with uh, Abhilek. Which is a very, very valid point Absolutely. there you make, uh, Abhilek. Uh, <clears throat> Rima, I'm coming to you now. But uh, before that, uh, I, I, I know that uh, we are looking to have a couple of poll questions. Um, uh, so... Rohit, if I can request you to run the first poll question, I'd like to use the results, you know, um, and see how we can take this uh, discussion forward. So what are the major challenges while managing fleets? 
uh, tracking, fuel theft, driver safety, uh, compliance with government regulations and high maintenance costs. Um, so I request uh, and I call upon all the participants um, to please uh, cast your votes. Um, very, very interested in finding out what you think um, are major challenges while uh, managing fleets. So maybe we leave it on for another 10, 15 seconds. Um, may, yes. I, may I say one thing? I saw yes, one please, interesting please. thing and I cannot stop myself is whenever we think about safety, we always think of rider safety normally. Right. Through this whole, through this panel, may I uh, provide one data point that more than 95% of the assault happens by rider on the driver, not the other way around. Yeah, yeah. We only read about the more uh, juicy stuff in the newspapers, but it is the riders who assault drivers 95% of the times, and it's only the 5% of the times when reverse is true. That's a reality that we live Absolutely. in. Absolutely. I mean, that's a, that's a very, very valid point you make, uh, Vilek. And something uh, uh, very rightly you said uh, that it never gets reported, right? What we see in, in the news and in the media is, is, is always those small percentage of cases where uh, the, uh, the rider is assaulted. But unfortunately, the, the other set of uh, news you know, does not um, come to mainstream media. We really need to do something to change that. Thank you very much for bringing that up. Um, Rohit, uh, Ashik, I, can, I can share the results. Yes, please. Yes, fantastic. So, so we've got 52% um, um, saying fuel theft and 52% saying driver safety. So, Abhilek, uh, the point you made is clearly something people understand as well. Uh, the top two uh, challenges while managing fleets are driver safety and fuel theft. Um, clearly, people don't think tracking as that much of a big challenge. So very, very good results there. So let me take that uh, uh, to you, um, Rima. Uh, now, uh, you clearly saw that you know driver uh, safety is, is one of the most important uh, um, aspects and, and Abhilek mentioned that as well. Um, I mean, in India, you know, we've got a very, very wide spectrum of fleet operators, right? We've got the really small owner come um, uh, driver operators, you know, single vehicle operators, and you've got small, medium, and you've got large fleet operators who've got thousands of trucks. I'm sure you fall uh, uh, among the, the latter part of the fleet operators. Now, now, digitization journey is very unique and different to each fleet segment, right? Uh, 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 driver come operator is, is, is completely on a different digital journey as compared to a large fleet operator, right? Um, and it's not easy. Right, you know, um, one cannot completely transform their entire fleet overnight. It's a, it's a gradual process. You've got different ages of vehicles, uh, different you know uh, brands of vehicles. Now, um, how do you gradually scale up, uh, you know, digitization uh, in a fleet without actually disrupting your current set of operations or the relationship you have with your uh, you know customers and clients? So, what are your thoughts on the digitization journey for fleets in India. Thanks, Kaushik. As we all know, logistics is one of the most important industry and technology and digitization is just going to be the next, uh, it's just a way forward. You can't compromise on it. We have people from Uber, we have people from Shell Telematics and they've already said how important technology and how the space is really growing. Um, you know, I think firstly, I think it's very, very important for a small or a mid size or a large scale. So large scale people are already educated and that's when they already invest in technology. Yeah. But a, a small scale, like one or two uh, vehicle owners or maybe a 50 owner, they may not have the kind of capital initially to put in the kind of money in technology. So I think educating them about the importance of technology is very, very important because technology is not only used for tracking as the poll said, it's used for many, many, many more parameters. So post education, you know, they also have to analyze what are the image requirements in a phased manner. If they Do they need tracking first? So they have to one, you know, so I'm going to actually give this example. When my journey, I, I started, like Rohit mentioned, I started 10 years back and I'm not from a logistic background. This is my father's business and we have two partners. 
and we actually cater to cold chain transportation and we work with pharma clients and when i joined it, this industry uh, technology was at a very raw stage okay so we only had gps right. which at that point of time it was very expensive it was only used for tracking there was no uh, reports it used to not tell you the driver behavior so when i joined i you know gradually first took a gps then because we were carrying temperature controlled uh, you know uh, consignments we invested in data loggers which give you a report stating what is the temperature so i'm just actually breaking it down how we graduated and how we came up to the scale where we are today then we realized the need of an hours to implement temperature sensors because clients if they have to be at peace because pharma medicines are used everywhere and when you are transporting that you have a lot of responsibility on your head so uh, i'm going to distract i'm going to like digress i use i tell all my drivers beat everyone in my actually top management whenever we interact with drivers we say please understand what you are carrying you are going to save the nation so please understand don't mess up with the temperature don't switch off the ac we always keep educating and training them even top management gets involved okay so temperature sensor was in need of an hour we implemented temperature sensor we started giving them online tracking which i i'm sure uh, abhilek will you know they also have tracking for passengers when for safety purposes right so um we started giving them online tracking then we realized need of a uh, electric locks because your consignments so we have our own locks which are not electronic but we have our own locks so we started investing in that but the need of an hour became electronic locks so i think then we also then you know when we initially we had a local vendor who used we used to use the software we realized internally it was becoming very challenging how to take the booking how to interact uh, how to plan how to geo fence how will we train the drivers so inish during pandemic we realized the need of an hours to implement erp so we used that time to you know implement erp where we get, got everything under one roof so be it account to billing to online tracking everything became extremely transparent so i think that is very very important to first educate people on why you know technology and digitalization is important because you get so many reports like some you know sometime back very mentioned the driver's behavior so initially the bus we didn't have tracking now you can even track if they're over speeding we get alerts so we set alerts for our drivers and we actually call them and tell them why are you going so fast how much time hai you know in fact now government has also come up with a norm nhai has just said that you know drivers are allowed to drive only 8 hours they have to rest that becomes easier so also timely delivery safety of consignment safety of driver everything can be managed by technology so my personal uh, advice to a small scale to a mid scale or to a large scale of course like you said 3p a logistic people where there is already cross selling there there would be air there would be road they cannot operate without technology online tracking is needed at the same time where the consignment what is the temperature if not temperature where is the consignment what is the stage what time will when will they get the delivery i think that is very very important this is from the client side for internally i think transparency is extremely important it also becomes easier for top management to track down and you know explain where are the pitfalls because there are so many reports which come to you where you realize and then you can train your drivers in a particular manner you can train but for all this you also need skill staff because so luckily i have people so my drivers are 60% of my drivers are old drivers so we trust them a lot and even when it comes to my staff i have all my colleagues are they've been with us from the time the you know my company started so it was very easy to change them from old methods to new methods but you have to do it in a phased manner because if you just dump it technology here chalo use karo it doesn't work like that you have to train them at every point so if you're looking at even investing please do it in a phased manner that's my you know suggestion excellent point seema i think you know one very important point you made is is about sensitizing the drivers right um, very clearly you know in a, in a, in a in a business like yours where you're transporting uh, you know very very uh, specific cargo right um, it it's very important to to uh, educate the drivers 
and make them understand the importance of you know something they're doing. I'll I'll come back to another point uh, uh, to you in a few minutes from now. I see there are some questions that are coming up as well. Uh, uh, we do encourage all the uh, audience participants to post your questions and let me take this question up. You know, very very interesting to the point which Rima also mentioned now um, is uh, uh, is a question from Sim Chong who says. I don't seem to see data science used in predictive maintenance in fleet management solutions, right? Um, the focus is still on asset tracking, um, you know, rudimentary data processing, you know, and, you know, that throws up, uh, that is thrown up by the GPS or even your tracking system and so on. Um, uh, Benny, maybe you can answer this, you know, how do you see uh, predictive maintenance, you know, obviously is something that the OEMs are already working on, right? From their uh, uh, sophisticated uh, engine control units and, you know, their uh, their service and warranty mechanisms and so on. But as a fleet management solution provider, what are your thoughts on using data science to enhance predictive maintenance? Yeah, indeed. Um, in fact, uh, data is going to be the king uh, in this uh, latest century, I would say that. However, having a large pool of data is one thing. And whether we are using it and turning it into some actionable insights is another thing. So in many of the current, um, I would say, fleet management company, um, well, telematics that they use or the data that they use mainly is really on the GPS. Um, and I believe that um, the key for the success of using these data is not simply just uh, relying on it as a GPS. Um, in, in the, moving forward, I would say that the key is whether we can really create an integration, so having interconnected systems that can talk to one another and provide you, um, I would say, a unified view so that all the data um, among all the different systems that you have will help to actually integrate and provide analysis that you can have so that you can have more analysis on how to take an informed business decisions. Uh. So um, with our shell telematics, actually we aim to create such a system so that we can help to fit in all streams of data into a single platform to help extract actionable business insights from it. Uh. So we have customers from different industry um, whether it is uh, from a fleet management perspective or from an ongoing rental, insurance, all these companies as well. They have different needs, different business needs as well. But what we can do is take an example, we integrate our fleet cut systems data together with a field management system um, so that we can help to identify and ramp them up to any potential field frauds that can potentially happen. Alternatively, there could be also data that would help them to predict whether there is any potential because of the behavior of the drivers. Maybe let's say, well, these drivers always have high gear using the top gear um, in a car um, versus the other. So potentially in terms of the maintenance, we might need to, well, apart from just some safety or from a correction of the driver's behavior, we might also need to know uh, whether this is a time for us to do more regular maintenance um, or gas oil change kind of things. On the other hand, probably on the um, sort of an ongoing maintenance perspective, from an insurance perspective. Mm -hmm. If the car is, well, sort of uh, not well maintained from the driver behavior that we see, potentially the terrain maintained for this car would need more than uh, drivers who have, who, who drive whose driving behavior is much better. And that would actually indirectly predict how the maintenance cost of the particular car or the reselling value of the car. Um, so it, it really depends on the industry, where you come from, and see how we can integrate the data into it. There is no one size fits all, but at the same time, it is really something that is important, how we can integrate everything together, but not just on giving you the data itself, but also on the data-driven recommendations that will be able to help you to take smart decisions. I think that is a key for having Shell Telematics as well, as one of the partners. Excellent. You know, Barry, I think, you know, you said it right, you know. Uh, helping fleet managers make decisions based on the data that's being gathered. You know, I think that's going to be a very, very critical. Chandresh, I want to come to you now. So I think you are slightly, you know, in a, in a different um, uh, um, space here, you know, with especially looking at personnel uh, transportation and personnel fleet management, right? Uh, now, obviously, when we talk about some of the key features, you know, like geofencing, we spoke about driver behavior monitoring, vehicle performance monitoring, and so on. Alarm systems, you know, we have seen that, you know, in, in, in Uber, in Ola as well. Um, now, obviously, they help reduce risk and accidents. But, uh, you know, one of the points which uh, Abhilek also mentioned earlier is 
is is driver safety right um, you know uh, one of the key areas that we are looking at is is through notifications and through apps and software is is to help fleet managers optimize routes and reduce downtime right especially when you talk about uh, personnel management personnel fleet management solutions optimizing routes uh, is is very very critical now how will such deep telematics based insights and reports help fleet managers you know leverage analytics based outputs right um, and convince let's say some of the fleet managers uh, in the personnel transportation space uh, to to adopt fms or to adopt fleet management solutions um, to to ensure employee security during transportation so i think the the focal point for for you is is employee security right just like for rima you know it's about cargo security right for specific uh, transportation needs what are your thoughts revolving around employee security when you talk about personal transportation thank you kashik thank you so much uh, quite an interesting conversation um, so you know a lot of information out here i think uh, from a personal transportation i think what is important is that um, you know things have changed a lot in last you know since the pandemic Uh, and now we are kind of you know i would say uh, we've gone back uh, in terms of the overall supply situation almost 2 3 years back you know because you're restarting the whole 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 services given that all of this was you know on a on a standstill given that there were no colleagues who were really coming coming to office to work so so this was completely you know uh, got impacted big time um the way this uh, normally works uh, is is that you know we it's it's a complete outsourced model uh, we don't own these fleets we work with uh, you know uh, operators who have um, you know fleets to help us uh, operate on this um, on on the uh, from a fleet management solution services perspective we've been using um, a tool called as move and sync Uh, across uh, our pan india uh, you know requirements uh, so we've got this in in all our cabs all the all the cab drivers all our colleagues uh, all the roasting everything happens on that particular tool um, you know this is this is such a critical important service um, you know and it it depends upon city to city but on an average it could vary from 2 uh, hours to 30 minutes of a travel time one way for colleagues to reach to office and then um you know during the non sociable hours you know anyways we have to provide these services to to all our colleagues um security and safety is is the number one uh, you know priority for for us in terms of ensuring that we are getting all these colleagues uh, they have a good experience bring them safely to work and then drop them back safely a right. um, lot of uh, announcement uh, which has happened over a period of time uh, especially for women colleagues who are traveling uh, in the in the non sociable hours um you know in terms of cracking in case they are they are they are the last one to be dropped home then there is a security guard which goes in the cab um to you know getting a confirmation of a so, uh, of of a safe drop uh, uh, you know intimation um and and all of this uh, you know uh, is is being monitored at at a regional um you know back end knock kind of a, a service where there is a team which just monitors all of this so in in terms of uh, uh, the features in terms of uh, the technology adoption and all that i think it is it is it is way advanced um but the 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 whole uh, impact on this uh, service industry from a from a pandemic perspective was so uh, intense given that there were no colleagues coming to office for almost 2 years and now we are starting again so you are like you know redefining the whole industry redefining the entire supply chain and everything from scratch um and that's where that's where we are right now in terms of how all of this is evolving um coming to the point on redefining uh chandresh i think one of the key areas that uh, many corporates today are doing is investing in electrification of their employee fleets right um you know for a variety of reasons you know green credentials leveraging subsidies by regional governments and general environmental friendliness right uh so how do you see this in wipro right do you have let's say for example any internal targets for fleet electrification say x percent by 2025 or by 2030 or do you also encourage employees to invest in or purchase evs for their personal transport right uh you know what is your vision for fleet electrification especially considering the fact that 
uh, your focus is on personnel transport and today and that is the uh, that is the uh, primary target even for uh, for uh, uh, the governments and subsidies uh, and so on so what are your wish, what are your thoughts on uh, fleet electrification for 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 people transport yeah so so on on this topic this is this is very interesting given that most of the corporates everybody wants to move on on the ev cabs uh, as as the next strategy you know there is no just two ways about it the whole uh, issue you know as you know is was more on the supply side you know there is a there you know we are constrained on the supply side right now given that almost last two years even the operators who are operating in this space they did not invest anything uh, so even if they have to invest i think things will surely look much better 6 months 12 months down the line but for now it is more about really uh, you know utilizing whatever is available um, and there is more supply coming in but it is slow and steady uh, and everybody is taking a cautious approach toward uh, you know uh, increasing the fleet size and so on and so forth you know uh, uh, from from our perspective you know we have uh, created uh, infrastructure in our campuses uh, from a, a perspective of also electrifying you know we've got those stations to to provide electricity to all our all our providers to do the charging and so on and so forth so it's 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 a joint collaboration effort which we are doing in terms of really seeing how we can work together collaborate and help uh, to really move uh, our entire fleet on 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 ev excellent you know i think collaboration is the key word you spoke about i think it's educating and improving awareness as well that is going to play a big big role uh, <clears throat> abhilek i'll come back to you uh, something very very interesting so i i read a press release recently that spoke about amazon and uber launching ride upgrades for amazon prime customers in india right uh, this is a very unique collaboration right which aims to offer special discounts to amazon prime number members uh, you know who pay for their uber rides using amazon pay right uh, now how do you see this collaboration between let's say a mobility services provider and an entertainment major shaping up you know uh, the mobility market in india right it's a very very unique collaboration right how do you think it will affect fleet management uh, in terms of technology adoption you know i i want you know to hear your perspectives on something uh, very specific because in india especially in tier 2 tier 3 rural cities the adoption of or the embracing of ott platforms you know amazon prime netflix hotstar you name it right is very very good so do you see this uh, as a as a logical step uh, to to bring a mobility service solution provider and an entertainment major to see if you can have a greater share of of uh, riders you know coming on to the uber platform how do you see this collaboration so <clears throat> more than anything it is about the customer it's about putting the customer in the front and center of everything Right. by that i meant is if you look at look at it then the amazon prime customer is technically a premium segment of customer mm-hmm. that exists it's a customer segment that's most likely uh, most likely going to utilize the services of uh, ride sharing now for such a customer segment which is which is most likely going to be a a i would say a loyal customer segment a high users customer segment their needs are also going to be slightly more different it's not a one off case they would want it's not just that they will take a ride and forget there will be lot of things because everyone wants that their loyalty should be valued okay. which basically means that if i am taking more trips and if sometimes for some reason i have to cancel then why should i be paying that cancellation charge it's not the amount it's the experience or the friction that actually makes a difference to the customer's experience so bringing in all the experience elements into one place is the intent of this partnership the upgrade is just the starting point so our intent is to create a differentiated end to end experience for customers for high value customers who intend to uh, continuously uh, be with the platform and uh, take uh, take trips on a very frequent basis so it is bringing in all those products and services into one place and this also means a lot of changes on the technology in the back and front because right now 
this is not geared about it like it's right now all the tech is about providing services it's not solution orientation it's service orientation which means providing solution customer support will provide uh, queries re resolve issues around safety around all those things with the customer in a different way but how do you bring in the monetary value the experience value all of that for a particular set of customers in one place analyze their whole behavior and then uh, i would say bring in those attributes and continue to create more and more products and services moving forward that's what is going to be the future in our mind and that's the direction that we want to go in understood so you are specifically targeting the the uh, amazon subscribers amazon prime subscribers so do you do you see this you know proliferating to the other customer segments as well in the near future or do you see it to be become becoming a, a niche uh, 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 offering, you know, looking at a specific set of customers only. No, it will be it will be personalized as per the customer segment. It's okay. just the starting point. It, it is going to be personalized. The offerings and the services will need to be personalized as per the needs of the consumer. And by the way, luxury of today is going to be hygiene of tomorrow. Okay. So what I'm saying is that it is a luxury today that we are trying to innovate. It is going to become a basic expectation tomorrow. That's how the business is. So we are trying to provide customized experience for all customer segments over a period of time. Understood. Understood. Very valid points. Thanks for that, uh, Bilik. Uh, Rohit, can we run the next question on the poll? Because I know um, I would love to discuss this uh, uh, with, with Rima. But I think it's very, very relevant for her. So if we can, if we can run the next uh, poll question, please. Excellent. So what is stopping fleets from adopting technology? Right? Is it lack of technical know-how? Is it cost, or is it integration with an existing solution? Right? You know, people feel that okay, look, I need to change everything. If I have to bring in a new technology, I don't want to do it. So, what is it? You know, uh, you know, people, please, please cast your votes. You can choose multiple options, right? If you feel all three are important, please, by all means, go ahead and select all three. So, one, uh, one option is missing Kaushik, which is <laughs> inertia. <laughs> <laughs> Status quo, yeah. Yes, it is inertia. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I think I think that's more of a mindset issue in 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 a lot of uh, fleet operators today. That needs to change. Hopefully, with the advent of technology, it will change. Um, you know, looking forward to it. Uh, maybe we keep the poll open for another ten seconds uh, and and we close it. But I completely agree with you. You know, I think we've had the opportunity to discuss this with a lot of. Um, um, uh, quote unquote old school uh, fleet operators who still swear by their way of doing things and they feel that look I don't need technology at the moment I'm happy doing the way uh, doing things the way I'm doing but I guess you know if if they still have to catch up with how the technology is evolving how the industry is evolving I think it's in, in imperative that they adopt you know technology solutions as well excellent so Rohit can we have the result Excellent. So lack of technical know-how, change management, change management, very, very important, you know, um, and, and cost and integration with uh, uh, existing solutions. Excellent. So clearly change management and cost seem to be, you know, the top two uh, uh, mind blocks, if I can call it, uh, that's preventing, you know, a lot of the fleet operators from, from uh, uh, adopting technology. So Rima, I want to bring yes, you so what are your thoughts? I think you come from a very unique perspective. You know, you're a second generation business person. Uh, I'm sure you have seen the transition, right? From the days of your, your, your father operating the business, which probably was a lot to do with, you know, interpersonal relationship, less about technology. Whereas now it's a combination of interpersonal relationship and technology. So what are your thoughts there? So, of course, lack of education is very, very important. I think that is a very bleeding area, right? Because like uh, Berry said, if there were reports which were, you know, given, giving the report is not enough. Analyzing the report is important. So when I, I will again share my experience when I joined and when I said it was only GPS and then we educated. Luckily, my dad, Ashok Kotari and his partner were very open to new ideas. Right. Maybe the people down line were not. They were not ready for changing the old methods to new methods, but they were open. So what we basically had to do is 
because i just joined i used to fit with each and every team and then i used to understand the business then whatever we were implementing in a phase manner i would educate them how easy it becomes aap log manually sab likh rahe ho why are you are doing this it's so easy to do this see immediately you get the information i think you have to keep interacting with them i think and when they are they understand the benefits it becomes much more easier so i think the know how of technology where people don't understand the importance like berry said that you know there are many in fact oh, when i joined and when i had only gps i didn't know anything i didn't even know what gps is because i have worked with companies which are completely technology was always taken care of worked with professional firms so i didn't know what it was what what uh, you know what this report will help me so first i had to educate myself to educate people down line and i also have my colleague tanvi nayak who is same second generation so we put in a lot of effort training our people so also i was actually going through the questions and someone has said that you know if a new driver joins in what do you do i'm sorry digressing because i think it will training them so what what technically we do when there is a process which happens when you you know get a new driver on board we basically ensure that the new driver goes with the old driver right. for a trip a couple of trips so he understands how what so because we are into uh, you know uh, cold chain transportation there are a lot of parameters the driver also has to learn he has to track what is the temperature going on in the you know there's something called cap command which all mm-hmm. of us have on the ac what is the temperature going on is it alarming is there something gone wrong whom to reach out to what is the sop which you have to follow so we ensure that we give training at every point and today it doesn't happen apne aaj technology le liya people are going to learn tomorrow and everything is going to get streamlined it's a very long process when we shift it from a small vendor to an erp solution it is a lot of work correct the data integration itself takes a lot of time and there is a lot which we also learn so like berry said all customers will have different uh, you know requirements like i may not want everything what a technology partner is giving me at that point of time i may have specific requirements which are very important to get implemented so my first phase will be to implement those because cost also plays a very very important role because right. technology of course comes with a cost and a mid sized company and small players i am not too sure whether they'll be ready to spend that kind of money like a small player if you're saying who has one or two trucks right. either he may be you know uske paas do gaadiyan hai chalo laga diya is it going to be that he be able to spend on technology no maybe not possibly he, he can be so the going forward also another model will be where people will not take competitors as competitors right. so mid size companies will collaborate with their their competitors and not call it competition because i may be uh, you know and integrating that information is also very important which only a technology can do so going forward that is a way for if you compete then you will be left nowhere but if you work together and also use the information in the right way first educate yourself before you educate others right. i think that is a way forward and I, then I, I, that, sorry sorry go sorry. ahead go no so the cost of course it will be at a cost but i think technology people also give a lot of um, assurance on how the payments are done so right. for a small player i'm sure the model will be different to a mid size to a large player correct correct so working together is a, is a very important thing you mentioned right you know you you are not in a we are not in an environment anymore uh, where you know you can um, work in silos it's very important to collaborate and work together so that brings me to the next point uh, you know you have had a very strong business background right you worked with uh, the likes of kpmg ernst and young you know even in media houses like star movies national geographic uh, and so on so you clearly understand blending of the old traditional style of fleet management with the with the modern style that uses technology and so on now elaborating on the point you made about working together uh, especially in a country like india right we are looking a lot to collaborate with young startups who have a lot of technology solutions but lack the experience of being in the industry right they are very young wonderful ideas but they don't have experience so what is your vision you know as as a second generation you know fleet management uh, uh, owner what is your vision for collaborating with startups to develop let's say a, a new age logistics ecosystem in india so personally of course uh, there are two parameters there are some which is 
amazing ideas, new startups, new blood, traditional methods. Traditional methods have experience. They exactly right. know how the industry works. So like, uh, you know, like Barry said initially, we are ready to give reports. We are ready to explain how, how the old methods are getting integrated. Working with them is easier. Okay. Mm -hmm. But using the information and educating even the old people, like old method, old uh, generation people to use the data and explain them what are the benefits. Of course, it can be a win-win situation for sure. But again, where if you have a poll, you will definitely get to a point where it will say costs. So it cannot be at a very heavy cost, personally. I That's what I think. It has to be, because going forward, technology is the only way. Everywhere, tech, like when, you know, like something like so small, where we used to initially go and hum check, likte the, we used to now, everything is done online. Correct. For all industries, right? Everything. Now we go and buy food. We get food at home by just ordering. We have Uber, which comes. Pele, we used to do color. So everything is technology driven. But if yes. the new people are also open to listening to old methods, I think integrating both the methods together is a way forward. You, they cannot be rigid. The new methods cannot, new generation people can't say, Are we have this? Because what they have may not really be practical when you put it to use. Exactly, exactly. That is only an experienced person will be able to tell you. Because like today when I go and study, it is all theory. But when I actually sit on the place and I work, the dynamics are completely different. Correct, correct. So it, I think it's the same. So when you have a new generation person coming and coming up with a solution, one, he has to show the old generation people what are the benefits and why is it X, Y, Z. And if correct. they have certain ideas that should be, you know, merged. Understood. Understood. Very, very valid point there, Arima. I think bringing together of both these schools of, of thought uh, is, is very, very important. So let me take an, a, a couple of uh, audience questions. So it's a very interesting question here from Avanish Pandey. Uh, maybe uh, Chandresh and, and Abhile can, you know, take a shot at it. Uh, <clears throat> driver is a core pillar of our transportation business. Uh, there should be a training and technical institute kind of a body or an organization from the government. I mean, this is something that um, we have discussed in, in other uh, forums as well, because today when we talk about uh, training, driver training, typically the OEM takes the responsibility, right? Whether you talk about uh, the likes of, you know, if you talk about commercial fleets, uh, Volvo, uh, Daimler, Ashok Leyland, they all have very comprehensive driver training programs. But is there a need today to have an independent or let's say government run body that that looks at driver training programs in order to equip them, make them understand, educate them about new technologies on how to manage a fleet or how to manage a vehicle and even interact with with customers. So Chandresh, your, your, your thoughts first. Yeah, so, um, you know, driver is a is a. Uh, you know, extremely critical player in this in this service. What we provide to our colleagues because it starts with um, the, the initial interaction. You know, when a colleague is boarding the cab uh, to the time the colleague gets dropped, the entire experience during that time, the conversation, how the driver is, um, you know, really driving, the safety aspect, and all that. So, you know, driver is extremely extremely important. Uh, uh, you know, player in this in this whole thing. And we, we do a lot of work with, uh, with our partners and the drivers in terms of um, not only, you know, about the driver training, but wellness, uh, you know, doing uh, more connects uh, just before the, the shift is going to, to, to start in terms of when the, when the drop happens and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of interaction between the teams on the ground, uh, between uh, the team which really manages this whole, whole, whole uh, process and the drivers. Uh, and the representation from the partners as well who are there on the ground to make sure that, you know, there is all the proper information and everything is given. There is a lot of tracking also which happens uh, from a data perspective in terms of uh, incidents which happen and so on and so forth. And, and, you know, and then really doing some more analysis in terms of what really happened. Um, there, is a, there is a feature and functionality of, of tagging drivers who... Uh, right. you know, need more focus in terms of uh, re-emphasizing, uh, you know, certain trainings and so on and so forth. Um, so, so there is a lot which is happening, but given that the way the, this particular uh, sector really works where, 
um, you know, it's it, it all depends upon. So, you know, there, there are times when these drivers move around different, uh, you know, agencies to, to work. Um, there are there are times uh, during the harvest season and all that these drivers all go back to the to the villages. Uh, so there is a lot of um, you know variability which really is is there and, and hence it is extremely important that you know you can't really you know this is a kind of an operation where you cannot say that I had a good day yesterday. You know today is 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 a new start. Everything needs to go well. So it's it's kind of an everyday process which you need to you need to keep on keep on working just given the variability which which comes in. Excellent, excellent points, uh, uh, Avilik. Your thoughts, especially when you talk about uh, a quasi-government, you know, driver training program in, in an area, you know, like yours, where uh, the driver training is is a lot more essential than than other sectors. Uh, what are your thoughts there? So, did we lose you, Avilik? Uh, am I audible? You are, okay. I think Abhilek's okay. uh, co connection is a bit weak. Uh, Kaushik, like, maybe uh, uh, we can maybe do a question uh, with Barry while, while he joins. Yeah, yes, maybe yes. maybe I can follow up on this as well. Actually, yes. on the safety, I mean, on the training piece of it, actually. I would say that um, not just on the government side or the OEM side, even for Shell, um, we also have uh, this sort of support to the customers itself as well. Because we leverage on the um, operations that we have across um, Asia, which we have the biggest one, actually. Um, we have a fantastic insights about um, what is the industry's latest trends, as well as uh, the driving behaviors. And with that, actually, um, we have different um, safety training programs, uh, which is sort of, I would say, well, I would not say world class, but at least we have different best practice that we can get um, from different countries um, and integrate that together so that we can provide um, tailor-made um, training safety driving behaviors, which is a blend between theory and practical kind of things. So that would also be some things that um, were received by many of our customers itself, because we believe that actually um, the, um, the, the drive behind this is it's not just about well, safety behind. behind. From, from at the end, actually, there is a commercial fuel economies behind as yes. well. Because imagine if the drivers know how to actually, well, try not to speed and not so heavy on the pedaling, actually that indirectly also have some sort of a few economies behind it. Um, and indirectly, it also helps to uh, bring more safety uh, for the driving journey as well. So that is something that we are helping our customers um, to aim for um, um, a better, better, better journey and better life uh, for the company as well. Excellent point. So, so what you're saying, Barry, is, is a combination of classroom training and on the road training. Is, is, is very important in order to, to have a comprehensive set of uh, uh, training procedure or a training manual that is going to give the drivers a, a, a full or, or an all-round uh, training experience. Sorry, Abhilek, you are back again. So your thoughts, you know, before uh, uh, we move on to yeah. the next question. So I, I'll, I'll actually echo what Barry was saying, that uh, the component wherein technology comes into play because at the end of the day while a driver is driving it's not just that he's he or she is driving there are a lot of technology elements that come into play that they are operating with so they need to be comfortable with that they need to know how to use things that they are supposed to use to the best of everyone's advantage including themselves and the rider and also the person on the road so i think uh, Wherever the new technology, the new things come into play, there, there needs to be a public-private partnership and such yeah. institutes are going to play a critical role in that. One thing where, uh, though, where I believe that uh, uh, government needs to fix is the process of issuing driver's licenses because that's, that's become way too easy and uh, everything right now. So they need to ensure that only those people who actually are able to follow the rules, have a good knowledge, et cetera, are able to get the license. That responsibility cannot and should not be moved and shifted to the private sector. It is an impossible responsibility if it is done. You don't fix the process of issuing driver's license. Please don't expect us to go and train every driver and teach them how to drive. That's correct, not going correct. to happen. Yeah. Uh, that, that's always been an Achilles heel you know, in, in India, right? Um, at the point of issuing the driver license. So hopefully that will improve. So last question. Kashik, I just yeah. have something to yes, add. Yes, sorry, sorry. So I please, have go, go like big driver management is something which even which is very close to us, right? Right. Our OEMs really support us. 
correct with a lot of trainings okay That's very important yeah for safety and uh, we also have sops in place because we work with pharma clients so we internally also take driver training um also i would just like to add the welfare of a driver is also very important as much as technology and everything to ensure that they are they are always in a good mood they are you know in a good mood and they don't they don't have any issues before they go for a ride they've rested well i think that is also very important only technology will be used if they are exactly. in a better state right if they are not and also skilled like i said if there's a new driver you ensure you he is followed with a senior driver first so that he knows what is the route how to drive what are, what are the parameters he has to take care of if that is done i think the process becomes a little easier the utility angle is also very very yes. important there so yes. last question before i hand over to rohit a uh, very very interesting question from somya brata das uh, maybe reema 20 seconds you know abhilek 20 second answer will we see driverless trucks will we see driverless cars in fleets in india anytime soon no <laughs> No. no, I don't think so. <laughs> not, with the infrastructure right now, yeah, with the infrastructure <laughs> right now, maybe much later, but not not in near future for sure. Till the time no. we start driving in lanes, it's not happening. <laughs> Excellent, good question. So, I mean, I, I was about to give that as a follow up question for Barry saying, um, if if the fleet operators are ready for driverless trucks, is Shell ready to offer? solutions for driverless fleets so <laughs> very uh, what are your thoughts there have you seen any examples in other regions uh, in the world that uh, that are already moving towards this yeah indeed um, well we see that actually this is a emerging trend as well um customers are willing to try out with different types of alternative um um fuel solutions that they can do um not just on the traditional ic fuel but also um on some of like for example ev um rng um or uh, some other hydrogen as well so we are testing out even in markets like in america as well there are also different types of things that we are trying to explore because for shell um our direction is actually to help to decarbonize uh, not just um for, from shell's operations but also helping our customers to decarbonize as well our ambitions is actually to um by 2030 we have 20% reductions in the decarbonizations um and by 2050 we actually completely um become a carbon neutral business so that is the things that we are trying to um and work out with different customers and telematics is one of the things that we are trying to help it out as well because that would actually help our customers um to track and see what are the alternatives that can help them to accelerate to the zero this will be i would say um is is a starting off um of the journey um it may not be the complete solutions but they will help us to 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 drive to this zero journey in the longer run Apologies I think, you know, that I have to. Yeah, yeah. apologies. <laughs> I have to run now. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. thanks so a I lot. think to to summarize, you know, um, I think I'll I'll take off on what Barry mentioned. Uh, working towards carbon neutrality is going to be the overall goal for every country in the world, right? And I think every industry has a role to play. Most specifically, the mobility industry with the commercial vehicle OEMs already talking about uh, net carbon. Uh, um, uh in their fleet so i think you know the future is very bright we will see more and more technology adoption um and and we will see a lot more collaboration you know i think that's the bottom line uh, gone are the days you know where we uh, where we had silos of working uh, we need to break that and ensure we work together and develop a very very comprehensive ecosystem so thank you very much panelists you know i now hand it back to uh, to uh, rohit uh, over to you rohit uh <clears throat> thanks so much uh, the entire speaker group thanks for taking out the time and you know joining us uh, and koshik as always uh, for the deft uh, moderation thank you so much uh, now we'll move on to the final uh, you know uh, part of this session which is the presentation by tenzi so i'm just going to quickly introduce him and move on to that part so uh, now to shed more light on shell fleet solutions and some of the interesting innovations they're working on i would like to invite uh, tinzi who is telematics business development lead at shell uh, just to give you a brief introduction uh, tinzi has over 12 years of experience in the energy industry serving upstream downstream and infrastructure working with teams from different cultures and background he is someone who is curious minded about it and technology and he combines his strong commercial experience and it knowledge to help shell fleet solution customers connect the dots using technology 
and the insights provided by Shell Telematics to win in the world of tomorrow. Over to you, uh, Tenzi, to take it forward. Um, thank you, Rohit. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. So, sorry, um, can you share a slide, please? Yeah, hi, I can... Rohit, my uh, op uh, option to share the screen is disabled. Can you please enable that? Uh, it's 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 it should be there. I, I was sharing at that time. Now you can. Check. No problem. Uh, okay, while, perfect. While while waiting for the slides to be up, I just I just give an overview of the India markets right now. In twenty twenty one, the shelf telematics uh, uh, market in India is uh, as I mean the India telematics market is expected to be around USD one billion, um, and this is expected to grow up to uh, USD three billion um, by twenty twenty seven. And this is actually with a CAGR of about 21.52%. Um, they are being driven mainly because of the, uh, from a regulation wise, the government of uh, India is basically trying to implement 100% GPS based toll collections system by doing away with the toll books by 2023. Um, from a market wise, uh, I, I think the sharing from uh, Rima just now is really important, right? Because um, she mentioned that when she set up companies, uh, there's nothing about them. Um, nothing about technology that her company was utilizing. And from a market wise, we are actually seeing a lot of changes from that particular uh, switch from the GPS based tracking only to telematics based systems today. And, uh, and that use cases is basically today in India itself, they are all driven by data driven. What it means is that you see a pretty difficult maintenance. And I saw one question around this in the um, Q and A's, and we have that uh, under Shell Telematics. We have usage based insurance, which is expected to grow really big in the coming years, uh, asset productivity and even the fleet utilization. What is really important in between now and the 2027 in terms of trends, um, we, we see the trends of EV vehicles being uh, really big in outside of uh, India. They are growing in uh, Europe, growing in North America, and with the, with the energy crunch and the LNG shortage, the gas shortage in uh, Europe, these are all expected to play an even more important role in the coming years, and India will have the same move as well. What it means is that from the advent of the EVs, the new cases will move towards that, the EV ecosystem, charging analytics, EV energy usage, state of charge of the vehicles, uh, firmware updates on the EV software. So this ties back to the connected vehicles, right? Because um, the vehicles today is basically a dumb vehicle. You buy a vehicle and you, there's no way for you to communicate with the vehicles to really know the status of the engines, uh, whether there is any at loose shortage or things like that. And with the connected vehicles in the future, they are all possible to update the software. What it means is that just imagine your iPhones and Android systems right now, your your phone, uh, your car will be able to do the same, uh, having a new function uh, almost every single month or even every single year without upgrading to a new vehicles. EV fleet management and even a route mapping for last mile deliveries or even for Uber, these are all will making a difference because in terms of last mile deliveries right now, the it is up to the driver to make deliveries based on the best routes, based on the driver knowledge. If you have a new driver that doesn't know the best route, uh, he or she will struggle to deliver efficiently. But with a route mappings um, under telematics, that is expected to grow really big to help the drivers and the fleet to deliver efficiently based on the, the, the traffic jams um, that is constantly changing. So if there is an accident happening, the driver will be routed to a new route and these are all being handled real time. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So in terms of the market growth, uh, market factors driving growth in India, there are a couple and uh, they are very, very relevant to most people increasing fuel prices, which is hitting every single country, it's not just in India. Fuel and vehicle tabs, which is really important for the fleet managers and the owner of companies, productivities and transparency, passenger safeties. Um, and this ties back to what uh, Shell really wants, right? We want everyone to go back safely. And I believe this is the same for your company as well. We want the driver to go back safely. And this ties back to one of the feedback that we got just now from the pool. Safety is really important. And the lastly is about the government because the Indian government has set up a really strong government regulation in 2019. And what it means is that the new regulation of AIS 140, which requires all new public transport vehicles in the country to be fitted with location tracking devices and emergency panic buttons. And trust me, in some countries in, in Asia, um, outside of uh, India, we don't even have this 
as part of the regulation. We have the location tracking devices, but not the emergency planning buttons. A really good example that I could uh, relate to this in, uh, is in Europe, where if, uh, all new vehicles is basically equipped with these uh, emergency planning buttons. So if there is a crash, it will automatically call the, the 999 or 991 or 911 in certain countries to really dispatch the ambulance to the location to provide the first help. And if you are crashing without anyone in the vicinity, you will get the help required. And these are all making a difference in the market and will continue to grow telematics in the market itself in India in the coming years. Um, can I have that slide, please? So in, ter in terms of uh, customer benefits, how does the shell telematics work, right? So we have the, your, your fuel card transactions, which is part of your shell card. And then we have data from your telematics and we actually combine both of them into one. And they are actually all the transactions and the vehicle's data, they are sent to the cloud. The data is being processed and turned into actionable insight. And this makes a difference for, for fleet, uh, fleet managers or operation managers or even the, the, the CEO of the company, because why? The data, when it's been turned into insight, it allows a fleet manager to have a key information. And from that information, the graphs, you make the right decision at the right time. So if it's, if it's regarding a predictive maintenance, yes, we can handle that. If it's regarding a driver safety, yes, we will know which, which one of your drivers is not driving in a safe manner, not to actually penalize the driver. So let me be really clear here. The system is not designed to encourage the penalization of drivers. The system is designed to take a soft approach for you to coach the drivers at all times to really say, hey, I actually noticed that you are driving in a not safe manner and I want you to go home safely on a daily basis. And can you please drive safely? The, 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 the staff and the, um, the driver will feel appreciated in the company, right? So these are all information that helps to make the decisions. And we don't see this 20 years ago, and we are seeing the, the these being delivered on a daily basis. It turned into a necessity today for most of the um, most of the customers right now. So moving on to the next slide, if you look at the um, in, in short, if you take a summaries, and um, of course, just now, I think I saw one question around uh, what, what can uh, telematics do for fleet managers, right? So there are a few things, and this is not claimed by, by me, but this is actually a research done before COVID around uh, 2019 by Gartner. The numbers are definitely won't change much. But uh, in terms of uh, telematics, it delivers up to 20% of the economies and 20% uh, increased compliance to the laws and uh, which means the speeding, the charge picking and stuff like that. 15% reduction of carbon footprint, which is going to be very, very important for a lot of MSCs going forward in the coming years. 75% reduction of the harsh picking, 20% reduction of safety incidents, and 20% reduction of the engine idle. And what this all means to a fleet manager and company is a total reduction of the total cost of ownership, which justifies uh, you spending that amount of money into real changing your fleets into a better system, right? So moving on, um, I think I just want to share a few more things, okay? Uh, I wouldn't go into this, uh, this slide too much because it's quite wordy, but uh, the key points from this slide is basically, what are the actionable insights that translate into direct benefits and what it means to you, right? There are pain points of most company, uh, most customers in the Indian market that we see. Fuel fraud is really high for the feedback that we get just now. High fuel, high operating costs. Uh, poor customer service or lack of controls over drivers. High number of speeding tickets, high accident rates. They are all being able to be addressed using the features that we have through a shelter analytics, fuel efficiency reporting, uh, idling costs, GPS tracking, driver safety reporting. We even have a predictive maintenance for you to actually do that. And they all result in the total cost of ownership for your fleet. And so I think in short, the system is able to do that. It's a data-driven system. What it means for you is that for the fleet manager to really sit down and say that, uh, do I want to continue using a GPS-based system or I want to move into a telematic system and try it out? These are all something that you can actually spend and you should be spending because otherwise you are lagging behind your competitors. It's turning into a market necessity today and it's something that um, a lot of companies are not able to offer right now. And today, Shell is here in uh, India. We want to offer this to our customers. Um, I think there's one or two more slides, if I'm not mistaken. Can we just have a quick look to that? Yeah, so 
Um, a really brief on this, uh, we have live map, which is the basics of GPS tracking, journey history for you to actually go back to history, and uh, driver performance and fraud detection, really um, zooming down into the driver behaviors and fraud detection in terms of the fuels. Um, vehicle performance, this is a really predictive uh, maintenance, geofencing, etc. And uh, the last one is fuel sensors, knowing about the fuels uh, consumption. And the last two things that I just want to share, if you look at, sorry, that's like this. Um, yeah, so quite a number of questions coming in. So in short, we have an integration of fuel cards. We have driver score cards to help you to manage your drivers. We have non-invasive fuel sensors. And most importantly, we are AIS 140 certified. So if you are really interested, reach out to our, our account managers. We are more than happy to give them more detailed explanation and help to consult your, your fleet to see what is the best solutions to roll it out. And, uh, we do have uh, one sharing as well, uh, the last one, the last slide, please. So there's one customer um, which is actually using uh, Shell Telematics uh, previously, and they actually say that um, after using a Shell Telematics for their vehicles, they are able to analyze the diesel privilege even down to a single liters of diesel. And just imagine, right, um, if you have a fleet size of 100 vehicles and you have a huge number of uh, these diesel privilege and we are able to zoom down to every single liters, how much savings that you make on a monthly basis. And this will all translate to your bottom lines, helping you to be much more competitive in terms of your cost and your pricing to your potential customers and to be able to be really competitive out there in the market. So um, that's from the... Mr. Labs and um, from Nandi Warehousing Company, one of our esteemed customers that have been with Shell for many, many years. We have many more examples out there. Back to you, Rohit. Thank you for the session. Thanks for the insightful presentation, uh, Tinzi. Uh, Ritika, if you could just kill your share. Uh, thanks for the insightful presentation, Tenzi. Uh, well, that brings us to the end of today's session. Uh, I wanted to thank you all for uh, joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the session and found it useful. I would firstly like to thank our audience for all their inquisitiveness and all the questions. I think we received 14, 15 you know, really good questions, weren't able to answer all of them, uh, but uh, definitely we were able to answer a few. And your attention as well. Thank you so much. And I would request you all to take a few minutes to share your feedback in the form that opens, you know, when you exit the session. Uh, next, I wanted to uh, thank our speaker group uh, for taking out the time from the busy schedule for this. Really appreciate your support. Uh, and lastly, I wanted to thank our partner, Shell Fleet Solutions, for supporting this session. Uh, thank you all for joining us once again. And as I mentioned uh, at the start of the session, I'm really pleased to inform you that we are back with the fourth edition of uh, Two Wheeler, Three Wheeler and EV Forum, uh, which takes place on 22nd September at the Eros Hotel, New Delhi. Uh, if that's of interest, do log into twforum.in to know more about the event and block your seat. In the meantime, here is a thank you and a goodbye from all of us at CBF. Thank you so much. Hi, guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you.